Good morning and welcome to our presentation of Beyond Words. We'll wait just a few seconds for everyone to log in and then we'll get started. All right, good morning. My name is Mark Slavkin. I serve as Director of Education at the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts in Beverly Hills, California. And today we're presenting the participants in one of our programs for older adults called Beyond Words. The Wallace, for those of you who have not yet had a chance to visit us or perhaps are in other parts of the country or the world, um, we're a performing arts center that was given an opportunity by the city of Beverly Hills to reimagine a historic post office as a center for the performing arts. So we have two beautiful theaters and an education wing with three classrooms that allow us to provide programming in arts learning for people of all ages, from young children to teens to early career actors to older adults. All of that is part of connecting people to the arts and connecting all of us to our own artistry and creativity. So that was the spirit of Beyond Words and thinking about how we can serve older adults, how we can help people share their stories and go beyond words, beyond the text on a page that we could write, but to tell the stories and listen, which is a different experience but also think about visual arts, about collage, about photography, and even about music as ways to tap into our personal histories, to share our journeys, and hopefully inspire all of you who are listening. So I wanna thank you on behalf of all of us at the Wallace for joining us today uh, to be part of the culmination of the class, which is something that the participants have been looking forward to um, with excitement, perhaps a little bit of trepidation, but I know all of them will do a terrific job. And I hope you'll be, well, I know you'll be moved and touched and hopefully inspired by these stories. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Deborah Pascarette, who designed the program and leads it um, with her expertise, her passion, her talent, um, and as a result has really created a community online. Uh, for these wonderful folks that you're about to meet. So let me turn it over to Deborah Pascarette. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our culminating performance for Beyond Words. As Mark mentioned, this is one of our older adult classes um, in creative writing, but this one has a little plus, and it really is about Beyond Words. In this course, the students not only wrote their stories, but they were encouraged with prompts to use photography, collage, music, sometimes um, 3D objects. There were all sorts of, to create recipes, to do all sorts of things to sort of tap into all of their creative faculties and to add those in, in terms of bringing up memories and just remembering stories that they wanted to tell. And so today you'll not only hear the stories that they're going to present, but you'll see the visuals that they created to go with that story. It has been an incredible journey. We've been together for 10 weeks and I have grown to love and care for all of the students in this class as they have for each other. And I think you'll see in their stories uh, uh, just a myriad of, of experience and joy, pain, sorrow, celebration. It's all here. You're getting it all this morning in a short amount of time. So what a gift you're giving yourself to be here. So I want to start right away by introducing our first story. Oh, I forgot to say at the end of our storytelling, um, we will have a few minutes for questions and answers. So if you have any questions that come up about the class or about anything you've seen this morning, you'll be able to talk to the cast at the end. So with any Without any further ado, now I would like to introduce our first storyteller this morning, Angie. Good morning, my name is Angie, and my story is Recipe for an October Afternoon. One medium-sized pond, 
a dozen mallards, five to six geese, nine garrulous gulls, a quarter pound of bread crusts roughly chopped, heaps of amber oak leaves for garnish. In New Milton, the small town at the edge of the New Forest where my mother lived is a park, about four blocks square, in which sits a duck pond. She often walked a mile or so through the center of town, past the railway station to feed the ducks. Each autumn, when I went to visit, my favorite time in England, we always made time to walk to the park. The park is not fancy. A grassy area sloping from the road to the pond offers a couple of wooden benches where we would sit after our excursions and chatter. Watching the antics of the ducks which bobbed bottoms up while they fed or glided quietly suddenly erupting into vigorous splashing. Gulls invariably added their raucous cries to the quacking of the mallards and occasional goose. A path around the pond leads under a canopy of trees to a small wood of mostly oak and sycamore trees, resplendent in their autumn costume of amber, orange, and gold hues. My mother would accumulate enough bread crusts to fill a small paper bag. She derived much pleasure from feeding the ducks and totally ignored my muttering about bread being detrimental to the duck's health. She would stand at the pond's edge, cooing to encourage the ducks to approach and then took great pains to distribute her bounty as fairly as possible. Not an easy task when the ducks swooshed around in a quacking clump in constant motion, fighting over each morsel. Mother would chatter to them, encouraging the timid and admonishing the overly assertive at the same time, trying to shoo away the gulls which swooped in like winged pickpockets. When the bag was empty, we would stroll along the path around to the other side of the pond and into the wood, startling the occasional squirrel into a tree. The trees, shivering in the October breeze, gently discarded their tan and gold leaves creating a crunchy carpet underneath, over which we rustled our way back to the road. A few days after my mother's funeral, with the sun shining intermittently, though the air was cool, I took a walk up to the park, as it turned out for the last time. The mallards were gliding sedately, if aimlessly, their iridescent emerald heads glinting as they caught the sun's rays. Suddenly a duck thrashed the water with outstretched wings, shaking like a wet dog, showering droplets all around. The oaks were shedding the last of their unbeliefs like tears onto the papery pile which mounded on the ground under the almost bare branches. I swished through this desiccated debris of autumn, lost in memories. That day, my mother was just a shadow, cast by my imagination, fading like the fallen leaves, the season ended. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce Anne and her story. Thank you, Angie. 
Um, my name is Ian Doherty, and I'd like to um, read for you my piece called A Recipe for Life. Seasonings are designed to bring a fullness, a completion to the food, an added joy to the experience of eating. Seasons can be added at any time in any order. Quantity and quality depend on you. Time needed, dependent upon circumstances and eagerness to proceed. Tip, the sooner you experience the seasons, the better oftentimes. So much of life seems to be a process in which things happen to me, like my birth, my family, my socioeconomic status, my religious background. All was a given at my birth, like what the three fairies gave to Sleeping Beauty upon her arrival in the eternal annals of my childhood. For so long, my experience of all these givens in life had the same storyline. I was born into a white, working class, Boston Irish Catholic, intact family with the requisite trifecta of poverty, alcoholism, and mental illness, religious addiction in the family and the culture made it so that suffering in an imposed and mandatory silence about it all would pay off eventually when I died and God rewarded me with the heaven because I've lived my hells on earth. Thank God I woke up before I died. Now I get it, that the truth is to be found in that wise saying, it's not what happens to you that counts. It's the story you tell yourself about what happens to you that matters. So my recipe for seasoning or allowing the better angels of myself to be present in life definitely consists of getting woke and continuing to do what it takes to keep staying awake. Seasoning in my life takes the form of various things that include one, staying teachable and reachable. Never want to be a dinosaur. That is, the person who knows it all and lives only on yesterday's wisdoms and experiences. Life is in the now and everything gets updated. Otherwise, I'm living in Jurassic Park, surrounded only by other dinosaurs. Number two, taking classes of various kinds, reading regularly across a range of areas. I watch TV, uh, too much actually. It includes PBS, Nat Geo, HBO, BET, Ovation, as well as CNN, MSNBC, a bit of Fox. I take sewing classes, calligraphy, art, writing, geography, geology, literature. Number three, having friends of different ages even. I have many younger, a few older, a few the same age. I don't really experience myself as a chronological age, although 66 is getting up there. Instead, I go with how I actually feel and don't buy into the nonsense that my age equates with who I am. Four, seeking wisdom. I find it in many, many places in life. The phrase, seek and ye shall find, is true in my life. I've been involved with therapy and 12-step programs since I was 25. Both have been the best universities I've ever attended. Also, being a psychotherapist who specializes in addictions and families, I've had the experience of literally sitting in every chair at the table in these worlds, and I have benefited greatly 
in being in each seat. I used to have formal teachers, people I looked up to, people I had high expectations of. And of course, none of them ever lived up to my standards, never. Because one of the gifts I was given at birth was the curse of perfectionism. No one ever could live up to the inhuman standards I lived with. I could never live up to them myself. Now, I have many, many teachers in my life, but I don't need them to be in positions of authority or have impressive sounding credentials or have lifestyles of the rich and famous. Instead, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, operates daily. I get my learning from people, books, TV, billboards, meetings, snatches of overheard conversations, sometimes even from the planes flying overhead with the banners trailing behind. Big lesson in life for me has been the one where I'm learning. I am loved for my humanness, not my intellect, not my wit, not my place in the world. I am loved because I am someone who messes up daily, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. I say one thing and often wind up doing another. I swear off things that aren't good for me and find myself still engaging in them. This is even after I've sworn never again for the 5,000th time. I have been admired at different times in life for things I can do, things I've achieved, but I am loved for the brokenness I let be seen. That has been a profound awakening for me. I've been seasoned for the first half of life by a view that said I was lacking. It told me I had to run away from where I came from and who I was. It told me I had to run toward power, money, status. Had to learn how to dazzle people with my intellect. The next half of my life has been seasoned with the knowledge that my responsibility to myself is to stay engaged in the never ending story of discovering and uncovering the precious woman I am and have always been. I played hide and go seek too long. I was the one hidden. I was the only one who could find me. I'm so glad it's never too late for happy endings or for new beginnings. Thank you. And my pleasure to introduce our next storyteller, Tony. Thank you, Anne. That was very nice. Hello. My name is Tony Jean, and my piece is called Live Memorial for the Pow Girls. Memorial Day marks the beginning of summer for most families. It also marks an important event in my family's history. My family decided to hold a live memorial for the four Pow Girls, as we like to call them. Our moms and aunties were all alive and still in their right minds, but time was passing quickly. It began as a birthday celebration for my mom, Naomi, but turned quickly into a celebration of life while everyone was still alive. Mom was turning 90 at the end of May, 2014. Mom was one of five siblings, one brother and four sisters. Mom was the oldest sister. Their older brother, Leon Powell, along with all three of his sons, and all of the sisters' husbands had passed years ago. It was just the four girls remaining with their children and grandchildren 
and Leon's grandchildren and daughter-in-law, Viola. It had been such a long time since all the Powell girls were together. Mom's second sister, Ellen, was 88. The third sister, Rose, was 86. And the baby sister, Rhea, was 82. Most of their friends had passed away and their few remaining friends were incapable of traveling to the party. The only people left to celebrate mom's 90th birthday was her family. 10 years earlier, in 2004, mom's 80th birthday celebration was held in Pasadena, but Rose from Texas had been unable to attend. One month after mom's 80th, cele 80th birthday celebration, her brother Leon's remaining son, Ronald, passed away. Ronald had flown out from the East Coast for mom's 80th birthday party, and I have a wonderful photo of him telling a funny story to mom and Ellen. Eight years later, in 2012, my brother Carl passed away. I believed it was very, very important to see the Powell girls together for perhaps the last time before anyone else was gone. At mom's 80th birthday party in 2004, her second sister, Ellen, had announced that she was never, ever flying to LA again, period, end of story. If we wanted to see her, we would have to fly to Oakland. Ellen's decision was a huge obstacle to mom's birthday celebration being planned at my cousin Carolyn Jordan's big, beautiful home in Rialto. Major family celebrations had been held at Carolyn's home and family members far and wide had agreed to fly or drive in, except for Ellen, of course. I consulted with Ellen's son and daughter-in-law, Roger and Ora Clay, and they told me to ask her, graciously accept her refusal, and then leave it up to them to soften her up. That was the plan. I asked her in December, 2013, when I called her, to wish her a happy 88th birthday. And she said no, and reminded me of her announcement 10 years earlier. I pretended I didn't remember, but I did. I didn't argue with her, but knew mom's birthday wouldn't be right without all of her sisters present. Roger and Ora worked a miracle and let me know in April that Ellen had very reluctantly changed her mind and would fly to LA one last time. I was as happy about knowing the Powell girls would be together again as I was about knowing mom was turning the big 9-0. Memorial Day weekend arrived and family members descended on Carolyn's home to celebrate mom's 90th birthday and just as importantly, celebrate the Powell girls being together again. We sat the Powell girls on a couch and waited on them hand and foot. We treated those old ladies like rock stars. We took pictures and videos as if they were truly famous. We did everything but ask for their autographs. The highlight of the day besides singing happy birthday to mom and watching her visit with her sisters was a special present or clay, Ellen's daughter-in-law made for mom. Or is a quilter, quite the artist. And she made a quillow, which is a pill, a quilt that folds into a pillow. On the outside of the folded quillow are nine photos. And when you unfold the quillow, it becomes a quilt, but not just any quilt, but a quilt with photos. It was absolutely stunning. Everyone was blown away by her artistry. Or incorporated many family photos representing the Powell girls onto the quilt. Or used mom's favorite color, sage green, and everyone was represented. She managed to give each Powell girl enough room on the quilt so their immediate family members could be seen. The edges of the quilt were lined with various family group photos taken throughout the years, so no one was left out. Everyone present could and did point to a section of the quilt and say, there I am. Mom had a wonderful time. She got to be with all of her sisters for what would actually be the last time. Sadly, Mom's second sister, Ellen, passed away the very next year, just a few days shy of her 90th birthday. 
Instead of the big party that was being planned for her by Roger and Aura, a funeral was held instead. Although it took six months of scheming with the help of my cousins, Roger, Aura, and Carolyn, mom's 90th birthday celebration was extraordinary. We got to visit with cousins from the East Coast, Texas, Utah, and from all over California. We just enjoyed being together as a family loving on our elders. My late beloved granny had always told her four girls that she hoped they would get along after she was gone. And her four girls managed to not only get along, but raise their kids to get along with each other also. Mom passed away in 2018 at the ripe old age of 94. There are only two pal girls remaining. Rose is 92 and Rhea is 89. That Memorial Day party in 2014 will always be such a special memory for all of us. A true memorial to four special sisters, the Powell Girls. It is now my pleasure to introduce Janet, our next storyteller. Thank you, Tony, for your story. Janet Ulrich here, and the name of my piece is live from New York. The Hunter Brinkley Report, 6.30 p.m. The Hunter Brinkley Report, 6.30 p.m. EST. The Hunter Brinkley Report, 6.30 p.m. EST live from New York. The NBC Nightly News. The Hunter Brinkley Report live on the Zenith. It's 1968. Wait, do not change the channel dial. Nixon, Kissinger, Nixon, Kissinger, Nixon, Kissinger, Vietnam. Lyndon reports, I'm not seeking a second term. Let the next president decide what to do. Vietnam. Reporter's notebook in hand, leaning into the zenith. Do not change the channel dial. News, 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 news. Who, what, where, when, how? Who, what, where, when, how, why? News, 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 news. Reporter's notebook in hand. Now I'm lurching toward the zenith. Do not change the channel dial. Barely 10 and destined to report. Report the news, the world news, the school news, the local news, the community news. Just report who, what, where, when, why. How? Reporter's notebook in hand. Barely 10. New York, New York. New York News Best. Who, what, where, when, how? Lurching toward the zenith. Now, change the channel dial. NBC to CBS. Direct from our newsroom in the New York, New York City newsroom. This is CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. The big eye to the peacock. Reporter's notebook in hand. Write news like Cronkite. News, 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 news. The president will address the nation tonight about Vietnam. Report, report the draft, report the troops, report the napalm, report, just report. A 10 year old CBS news desk live from New York, New York. Who, what, where, when, how? Who, what, where, when, why? Write news like Cronkite. Report news like Cronkite. Deliver news like Cronkite. Reporter's notebook in hand. 6.30 p.m. every night. Never miss a night. Hunter Brinkley report. Hunter Brinkley report. Walter Cronkite. Do not change the channel dial. Get away from the zenith. Reporter's notebook in hand. Don't change the channel dial. Don't get close. Boom overhead. Cameras in close cameras come closer. 55 years later, this is the way it is today, December 16th, 2020, reporting live. Not from the news desk, reporter's notebook in hand. And I ask myself, this is not my Barbara Walters moment. And the days go by. And I ask myself, this is not my Diane Sawyer moment. And the days go by. Reporting live from Zoom Connected. 
Good night, Chet Huntley. Good night, David Brinkley. Good night, Janet Ulrich. Not from a New York, New York news desk. Reporters not book in hand. Cut. Fade to black. And I'm pleased to introduce to you our next storyteller, Rosalie. Thank you. My story is a birthday to remember. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy third birthday, Rosalie. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not happy right now, sitting between my parents in this rickety, smelly, bouncy truck on my birthday. I should be opening brightly wrapped presents with a new doll and pink and yellow ribbons for my pigtails and having a yummy cake with three brightly lit candles and one to grow on. But my tummy feels nauseous in this rickety, smelly, bouncy truck. Everybody should be singing. No one is singing in this truck. All my precious toys and favorite clothes are packed in the back of this still rickety, smelly, bouncy truck. I'm getting more nauseous. Mommy said we're moving because of the war and we all need to sacrifice. I don't know what that means, but why do we have to move on my birthday? Both mommy and daddy are going to work in a factory to make guns and bullets and bombs, whatever they are. They laugh and call mommy Rosie the Riveter. Rosie is my nickname, not mommy's name. So confusing. And who will take care of me if mommy works? She never worked before. I'm very unhappy. My world is all upside down. Nobody wants to laugh and play. Not even my big brother, who is sitting in the back of this very Mickey, very rickety, smelly, bouncy truck with all the boxes and furniture. All he does is study maps about the war. There are a lot of grumpy and sad people all around. Oh, if my favorite cousins were here, they would throw me up in the air and catch me and we would all laugh and laugh. Instead, they're fighting people in faraway places called Germany and Japan. I thought fighting was bad. My aunt cries all the time. This is a very, very long ride. I think I might throw up. I think I have to go potty. I think I might cry too. And please enjoy our next storyteller, Sunny. Thank you, Rosalie. My name is Sunny Hilden, Sunny like the weather. And my piece I wrote is called Recipe for Holiday Happiness. A long time ago, for a very short time, I waited. Not waiting for someday, it's always someday. And not waiting for something to happen. There's always so much happening. There's no time to just wait for anything or any day or anyone. I was waiting on the go, waiting on people, a waitress in a family-friendly restaurant in St. Paul, Minnesota. I worked eagerly for teenage wages to fund my first drum machine for my one-woman recording studio in the living room of my childhood home. I dished up pancakes, peas, and pasta to feed my dreams, to write songs for legends, to sing for tens of thousands of people at a time all around the world. Now that I've made those dreams come true in LA, sometimes I get nostalgic for mom's midnight piano and home-cooked meals, hometown snow days, 
and ice skating around my elementary school's rink as I break the ice out here of whatever's next to taste of life's delights. Back in the icicle age of youth, I was on a mission like the first snowflakes of winter, crystallizing my value system to serve joy to millions someday. And in the meantime, which is still a nice time, to serve joy to just one or several people at a time, like family, like friends. I waited on the hungry, the tired, the huddled masses of fabulously fidgety children and slow, marvelously methodical retirees at the counter with eyes full of secret history, insights, and lovely common sense. I welcomed shy, sloppy, or frozen strangers, some popping in to avert frostbite at the bus stop outside the restaurant's picture windows. I warmed their smiles and frigid fingers with a cup of hot coffee poured with a song or a naturally sweet steaming mug of cider I upsold only because I believed in its worth and its winter wonders as much as I believe in arts education for every child born on earth. I've loved all my jobs, the by the hour ones I outgrew and quit to move on, the by the book jobs I changed to move up, the singing and dancing and acting jobs I lost to the pandemic, and the artistic dream jobs I create out of nothing, which is everywhere, like the air and the sky, and my memories of my grandparents, my parents, my children, and my friends who are all gone in a way but live on in my flights of fancy. We are artists. Music, theater, and dance know full well that quarantine, travel bans, wearing a mask can be as celebratory as theater, fascinating and inventive as we choose. So we color grins on our masks we travel anywhere with a book or a pen on a piece of blank paper in a Zoom class. We reach out like ballerinas to the back row, keeping in touch without touching. We grow productive in or out of our own homes, some like seeds in huge farmed fields, growing things for big restaurants, some seeds in a simple planter on my patio, longing to be basil and baby carrots in time for my holiday meal. Our recipes will be different this Christmas. Mine will be my recipes. My family's usual scrumptious feasts will be thousands of miles away from me. All of us staying home, spread out across the country like ingredients, hunkered down, spirits up. We're good boys and girls and Santa knows it. I'll be serving more helpings than ever as I keep refining <clears throat> my recipe for holiday happiness. And here it is. Be a starter. Let hope rise. Marinate ways to nurture inner and outer peace. Set aside to chill. Smother loved ones with juicy, blissful memories. Sift through the years until only the best parts of the past are left to savor. 
clarify each day as yours to cherish, to own, to share, to learn from, to reframe and enjoy alone or with others. Spice it up, orders up, more milk of human kindness. Season with sage advice and peppermint smiles, brushed, flossed, gleaming, merry and bright, ready to thank. Blend in zest for life, stuff with awe. Stir up imagination like a kid. Add frivolity, curiosity, crafts, dancing in the kitchen, hiking up hills that are alive with the sound of music. Drink water like the evergreens, the evergreens that flourish for all through each grateful sun-kissed season of reverent, festive life. Like the creative measurements in my own grandmother's recipes, which we found after she passed away, add enough of whatever it is you need until it's right. Keep adding love, I say. Keep serving love. More, please. And now I'd like to introduce our next storyteller, Eric. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, my name's Eric, and my story is called Neighborhood Walk. Feed the cats, clean the cat box, check email. I should call Steve. I wonder how his treatment's progressing. What a horrible time to be treated for prostate cancer in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe I should just email him. I need to go get my follow-up blood tests today. I want to go for a walk. Encouraging news on the vaccine rollout. I'm not sure we know enough about the virus, but maybe we don't need to know more for the vaccine to work. I have to figure out that beyond words assignment, neighborhood. My first reaction is Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers. That won't do. I need to make sure my daughter, Julie, registers for the final performance. And she's the one who got me into this class. I wish this COVID mess was over so I could see her again. It's already December. I need to put up the Christmas tree. At least I got the lights up outside. They look pretty pathetic compared to what some people are doing this year. The year of being stuck at home, or at least the neighborhood is lighted up. I'm feeling anxious. My mind is running fast and furious. I need to get out of the house and go for a walk. I didn't shower yesterday, no reason. I'm not gonna shower before my walk. I can wear a hat, no one will know. At least I'll shave and put on my sunscreen. Don't forget my mask. Hardly anybody wears a mask while they're walking. But that is just stupid, at least when we pass each other. Fortunately, not many people take my path. Wow. I've been walking for 15 minutes already. And I'm coming to the path I'd like to take. The day is brisk, but the sun is out and it feels nice and warm when I'm in it. Cross over the bridge and off the street, and now walking down the path next to the creek. Car sounds are still there, but they are growing fainter. Now I notice the hawk in the tree. I'm keeping my eye on you, buddy. Last summer, one of your friends attacked my head. So no funny stuff, I've got my eye on you. At least the hawk got me to finally start cutting my own hair. I was starting to look like Kramer from Seinfeld. What was I thinking earlier? I don't remember. It wasn't important. I was just fretting. The creek has water, but we haven't had much rain. I wonder where the water comes from. Over there is where I saw the bobcat and the coyote another time. The leaves are changing and falling pretty steady now. There's a cow up on the hill. He seems at peace with the world. What was I fretting about earlier? I don't remember. It wasn't important. 
Thank you. And now allow me to introduce you to our next storyteller, Anita. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anita. And my earliest memory is when we lived at 1800 and a half Arapahoe Street. We lived there when I was five to seven years old. Arapahoe Street, that's A-R-A-P-A-H-O-E. A-R-A-P-A-H-O-E. When I learned to spell it, I loved it. I love reciting the sing along, the sing song way it sounded. That's A R A P A H O E. 1800 and a half was the upstairs unit on the left side of a four unit apartment building. I remember the steep stairs we had to climb. You had to take your time, especially when carrying groceries up the stairs. The apartment was one bedroom. When you got to the top of the stairs, you turned left into the living room. Then you walked through the dining room that my parents converted to their bedroom. My brother and I had twin beds in the room after that. And the last room after that was the bathroom. The kitchen was situated on the right side of the apartment. Then the back porch. I remember my folks letting us sleep on the balcony outside on hot summer nights. I distinctly remember this time because it was when President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. I was seven years old. My mother was devastated. She cried and she cried. She kept the TV on watching all of the news coverage, the funeral, the trial, everything. She even bought all of the magazines, Jet, Look, Ebony, and Life. She cut out all of the Kennedy-related articles and glued them in a scrapbook to memorialize the events. She even bought the LP album, record albums of Kennedy's speeches. The story she would tell later explained how, she, how he had personally touched our lives. My dad worked construction and had been laid off and was having a hard time finding another job, close to two years without a full-time job. But he took all sorts of other odd jobs to keep the family afloat. Sometimes he would take me and my brother, we would play while he worked. Um, years bef several years before, he went to night school to study auto mechanic, but because of work wasn't able to finish the course. He used what he learned and for a time was a shade tree mechanic repairing cars for neighbors and friends. My father was also receiving unemployment. It must have been very tight and stressful for them because unemployment was about to run out. Uh, it, um, my father even suggested to my mom to take the kids and move back to New Orleans to stay with family if things didn't get better soon. The lifeline came when President Kennedy was elected in 1961. The first thing he did was to extend unemployment benefits for an additional 13 weeks. Whenever my mother told that story, she would always emphasize an additional 13 weeks. And as things worked out, that helped tide them over until my father got a job working for a construction equipment rental company. He eventually retired after working uh, for them, for that company for 33 years. So JFK was a big deal in our house. One pet we had on Arapahoe Street was a cockatoo. Actually, it was my dad's cockatoo. Mr. Cockatoo was his name. My dad was fond of that bird and would take him out of the cage and walk around with him on his shoulder. Even outside, the bird wouldn't fly away either. He would play with him. My brother would also hold him on his finger. I was a little scared of the bird and would only pet him if someone else held him. I went to Magnolia Elementary School first and second grade. 
I don't remember much about that school. The one thing I do remember is one day we had an art class and we were given brand new, a brand new set of Crayola crayons. Beautiful, bright. I think they were the chunky ones too. I wanted them. We had crayons at home, but they weren't the, like the ones my brother and I had. We had broken them up. Some, some of the colors were missing. So somehow I snuck them home. That evening, I took them out and was coloring with them. My mother asked, where'd you get those crayons? When I told her, she read me the riot act, explaining that those are take, that taking those crayons is stealing and that we don't do that. The next morning, she marched me to that classroom to return the crayons, and I had to apologize to the teacher for taking them. Believe me, lesson learned. I remember feeling so embarrassed. That very day, any life of crime for me was nipped in the bud. About a year or so later, as our family finances improved, my parents tired of renting and my, with the GI Bill, my father saved to buy a house, a house that they lived in until their passing 40 plus years later. Now my daughter, her husband and my grandchildren live in that same house, but that's another story. I'll never forget 1800 and a half, A-R-A-P-A-H-O-E Street, Arapahoe. I've even passed there from time to time to show my own children. Living there taught me the lesson to appreciate small beginnings. Thank you.